Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. All right, everyone. Hello. I am so privileged and honored to have you join this conversation with us today on Radically Loved. We have a very special guest. We have Mary Morrissey, who is an international speaker, a best-selling author, and the founder of the Brave Thinking Institute. She provides transformational coaching and helps us create the life that we love. And so in Mary's four decade long career, she's spoken at the United Nations three times. She's facilitated three week long meetings with the Dalai Lama and met with Nelson Mandela in Cape Town to address uh, significant world issues. And today we get to dive into her latest book. It came out in May, May 23rd of 2023. Um, and this is all about brave thinking. And you can see if you're watching this on YouTube <laughs> that I am a subscriber to the art and science of creating a life you love because I have sticky notes and dog-eared it and written all over it, which I'm assuming is the intent behind this book, Mary, um, or one of the many intents behind this book. And so, Mary, thank you so much for sharing this work with us. And we're just so honored to have you here today. And how are you doing? I'm doing great. And I'm just privileged to be a part of your work. I mean, radically loved and all of that can mean in our lives. So I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a privilege. I'm I'm trying to decide where to start because I, so your voice has been in my head as I've been preparing for this interview. I've been reading your story and finding so much. Um, and I'm sure this is, I, I'm sure you get this a lot. I can see myself in you in your raw, authentic sharing of this very vulnerable story and just the way that your own life unfolded. It really could happen to any of us. And you grew up in the 60s in the Pacific Northwest when choices for situations we find ourselves in our lives were very different than they are now. So I guess. I think a good place to start with would be with your um, unique origin story, what happened in your teens, the subsequent um, decisions and choices that kind of life threw at you and directions you took as a result of that. Why I do what I do in the world and have for the last 40 plus years in helping people discover that there's more in them than what's happening in their life. And how to pull from that than to shape new futures and results that they're in love with instead of results they feel victimized by. Um, we're going back to Beaverton, Oregon, 1966. I'm a junior in high school. My high school boyfriend has, um, we had dated four years. We met young. Uh, he'd gone off to college. Uh, at this point in the spring of 1966, in my junior year in high school, I'm class vice president. I am on the drill team. I have a lead in the junior play, and I've just been crowned homecoming princess uh, for my class. And um, my high school boyfriend comes home on spring break. May 1, I discover I'm pregnant. And I tell my mom and dad that I'm now pregnant. My mother wept for me as if I had died. In her mind, all her dreams for me were dying. Uh, we had a very hasty 10 person wedding. And a couple of weeks later, as I'm completing my junior year uh, in high school, the principal of the high school calls me to his office and says, Mary, what are these rumors I'm hearing about you? Are they true? And I said, well, if the rumors are that I'm pregnant and married in that order, then yes, they're true. And he just put his head in his hands and he says, Mary, you have great grades and terrific honors, but you will not be allowed to return here for your senior year in high school. This is Beaver in high school. He says, you can't come back here for your senior year. It'd be totally inappropriate for a pregnant girl to get mixed in with the normal girls. 
But if you want to get a high school diploma, which I did because my dream for my future life was that I was going to be a teacher. Um, I did not see getting pregnant and having a baby as a stop sign to that future. I just saw it as a detour that I'm going to have this baby. I'm going to love this baby and I'm going to become a teacher. It might take longer. So he said, if you want a high school diploma, which I did, he said, there's a place for people like you. It's not held during daylight hours. It's across uh, the river, actually in a part of Portland I hadn't been allowed to drive in after dark, uh, where the pregnant girls and the delinquent boys go to school after the regular kids come and go for the day. So it's in the evenings. So I drove across the river the fall, that fall, well, went into the school. I'm walking up these steps to a, a, a school. So I want, as you think about this story, where were you as you went into your senior year in high school? This is where I was. I'm walking up these steps thinking, okay, my new student body is girls who, like me who either have babies or are pregnant and guys who are delinquents. This is the new student body I'm in. So I went in, registered um, high school. Uh, I had my son in December, graduated from that high school, Washington Evening High School in May of 1967. And in, in July, I was in an intensive care ward in a Portland hospital, having been diagnosed with fatal kidney disease. Now, this is 1967. We don't have transplants or uh, dialysis that's available anywhere in regular medicine. It's just beginnings. Um, and the doctors told me they shook their head. They're very sorry. All the tests show that one kidney is totally destroyed with nephritis. The other kidney has 50 percent dis destruction and active nephritis. This is a death sentence. The only question is if we can get the blood toxin level in my body reduced enough to remove the right kidney, then maybe I will have six months to live. I'm in intensive care and I'm told this is my best shot. Six months to live. I may never see my little boy walk. I may never walk him into kindergarten um, or see any of the other things that a parent who loves their child wants to see and be part of in their child's life. And I'm deep down, I feel like I'm being punished. I don't even, clearly I'm a bad girl. I mean, I can't go to my regular school. I, I'm not normal anymore. And I get sent with delinquents to go to school. So I'm categorized in a category. So I feel like I'm a bad person. And now I'm told I don't even deserve to live. And this, I wasn't aware enough to really notice the train of thinking, but this was my thinking. Um, finally, they decided they could remove the right kidney. A woman walked in my room the night before the surgery, identifying herself as a chaplain who came daily to pray with people who were having the most surgeries, the most serious surgeries. My name was at the top of the list. She asked if I wanted somebody to pray with me. Well, in the the God of my upbringing was not a friendly place to go when you felt like you had really screwed up. And clearly I had screwed up, even though I love my little boy. I mean, I could, my best girlfriends I'd grown up with since fourth grade, their mothers got together and decided their daughters could no longer see me or talk to me as if what I had was contagious. So I've been, you know, all of these things had occurred. Clearly I'm a bad girl. She walks in and asks if, uh, I need somebody or want somebody to pray with me, but I was scared. And so I said, okay. And she pulled her chair next to my bed. She didn't do anything that looked like prayer in any of my uh, growing up of what prayer really looked like. Um, and she just simply said, would you be t willing to tell me what's been going on in your life the last year or two? I told her my story at the end of which she looked at me compassionately and she's Mary, everything's created twice. It was like, what are you talking about? And she said, you know this. In fact, everybody knows this. Almost nobody knows the power of knowing this. And then she said, the bed you're lying on, the nightgown you're wearing, the sheets covering you, the walls, the ceiling, the floor, all the machines you're hooked up to. First, it had to be, each one of these things had to be a thought before it could be a thing. I hear how much you love your little boy, but I hear how much you've been hating yourself. You feel like you shamed your school, you shamed your family, you shamed yourself. And now that you're considering how everything is created twice, could you consider the possibility that there could be a correlation between that toxic thinking of self-loathing and the toxicity that's rampaging your body and threatening your very life? Now, this is 1966. We don't have a mind-body clinic at Harvard or Stanford or UCLA or any of the other teaching hospitals. This is frontier to where we are in our collective understanding. 
And then she said, so what would you do with your life if you could live? I knew immediately I would raise my little boy and I'd become a teacher. And she said, could you believe it's possible that we could say a prayer and it would dissolve all that toxicity? And in the morning when they come to get you, they look at you and they say, wow, you must be, you look better. Let's test you. They test you and they say, we find no evidence of kidney disease. Get up, go home. You're going to be fine. Could you believe that's possible? And I told her the truth. No, there wasn't one part of me that could believe she was going to say some words and I was going to have this total healing. She says, all right, if you can't believe that, she says, I want you to remember there are infinite possibilities in the universe, infinite. So if you can't believe in that possibility, could you believe that there's a possibility that we could say a prayer and scoop the energy of that toxicity of self-loathing and all of the dis-ease that comes with that into the kidney that's going to get removed. And when it gets removed, instead of getting worse, you get stable and you start improving to the point where you're well. Could you believe it's even possible? So Tessa, I didn't um, believe it. But in that moment, I could tell she believed it. And it was the first time in my life where I ever, I didn't consciously make this decision, but it is what I did. I decided to believe in someone else's belief that was operating at a higher domain than mine. I said, well, I don't know if it's probable, but maybe it's possible. At the end of which she looked at me and she said, that's all we need. One corner of your mind open to the possibility. Let's work with that. Now, remind, let's talk about the science of this. This is before Sheldrake Unified Field Theory. This is before we have the, the physics, the understanding of physics. It's before we understand um, Talbot's work out of Stanford with uh, Holographic Universe or all kinds of science that shows how we're part of this energy we live and move and have our being in. And we have a vibration that we're operating from that dictates the field, the attractor field for which possibilities become ours and which ones don't. So she says, that's all we need. One corner of your mind open to the possibility. Let's work with that. And then she gave me a prescription, a different kind of prescription than the multiple uh, prescriptions I was taking daily for the immense pain I was in. She said, um, here's what I want you to do. After the surgery, your mind's going to be busy with the pain for a few days. As that pain ebbs, your mind is going to want to go down the well-worn paths of thinking that you've been doing. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to notice every time a thought of self-loathing comes up. And when that, we're gonna scoop all of the toxicity and all the self-loathing, we're gonna put it on that kidney that gets removed. So when a thought of self-loathing comes up, you say, no, that left with the kidney. Then immediately imagine you're holding a little boy's hand, feel the warmth hand. Now notice this form of visualization that's coming to me in 1967 that has not only the picture, but the feeling tone or vibration of being the person having that experience. We'll come back to this in a little while. Notice the little boy's hand in yours. Imagine you're walking him into a school and there's a teacher and your little boy's so happy to go into kindergarten. Your teacher, teacher welcomes him in the kindergarten class and you're there to be with him in this moment. He goes into class, the door closes, you hear the click, click, click of your heels. You go around the corner and there's your first classroom. Then fast forward and you're sitting in a great big auditorium or stadium and there's all these caps and gowns down on the stage and you hear your son's name called and he walks across the stage, gets his diploma, raises it up and you're cheering in the stands for all the many moments that you've been part of helping him achieve this goal in his life and your teaching career is growing. And then fast forward and you're sitting in the front row of a wedding. Your son's marrying the love of his life and you're there. You're the mother of the groom and your teaching career is flourishing. Just, just keep doing that. She left. The next morning when they came to get me for the surgery, I noticed that for the first time in weeks, I had actually slept all night without waking, no matter how much pain medication. I, I noticed it, but I, you know, then I'm off to surgery. Um, and after the surgery, I must have been what we today would call an unconscious competent that I did what she told me to do, but I wasn't aware enough to say, no, if I do this, it's gonna change things. I didn't know that, but I just did what she told me. Um, after about 10 days, my numbers had uh, stopped getting worse and were just stable. And then after two weeks in intensive care, they said, you know, 
you may have a little more time than we thought. After the surgery, the surgeon told my family gathered um, that one kidney was totally destroyed. We removed it. The other kidney is 50% destroyed. It's pockmarked. It's shriveled. We don't know if she'll even have six months. But now my numbers were stable enough. He said, if you want to go home for a week, we don't know if it'll be a week or two or maybe even three that you could be with your little boy. And I was so weak, I couldn't get my head off the pillow, but I wanted that. I went home in an ambulance and I had to go to the urologist several times a week in the beginning. And just my numbers stayed stable. And then they just started to improve and improve and improve. And about six months, between five and six months after the surgery, I'm sitting in a conference room at the hospital, surgeon, specialists. Um, my general practitioner in those days, family doctor, and they're all looking at the numbers. And the surgeon said, I saw that kidney. I know what it looked like. We have no science for why this kidney is operating as a whole perfect kidney. Um, and then they looked at me and said, well, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Uh, we don't know how long this will last or if it'll last. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was doing what she told me to do. And then over time, I got well. And that kid, that was in 1967. It would be 1971 before I would get myself into undergraduate school. And it was there that in that fall of 1971, I began to get really curious about how this occurred, not just grateful that it occurred. And that began the study that has guided me 50 years plus of study in transformation. So we all have forms of our life. Transformation means trans to go beyond the current form of your life and generate, make, align with a life that you absolutely love, not just the life you've had. And there's a way of doing that that I call great thinking. Mm, I love this. And, and you know, in, in retrospect, as I was reading Brave Thinking, I was wondering, and I think you speak to this a little bit in the book, Back then, back in the 60s and 70s, you weren't labeling it brave thinking, but that's exactly what you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so why about why it's brave? Yeah. Because we've all been trained in a kind of thinking that Henry David Thoreau called common hour thinking, which is really condition based thinking. I want to do this. Well, do I have the money? Do I have the time? Do I have the resources? Do I have the education? And we look to conditions for permission to do, have, be, whatever it is that we would love to have in our lives or be in our lives. And then the conditions have to give us permission before we feel like we can have them. That's common hour thinking. And we have all of us decades of programming in that kind of thinking. Because first thing you say, I'm going to do this. And the first question is, well, how are you going to do that? Brave thinking is the courage. And it's exactly the right word for it. It takes courage to think and live from a vision, regardless of the circumstances, situations, or conditions. And there's a process by that. But as we all know, if you've been watching CNN, constantly negative news on your TV, and you want to watch different programming, you change the frequency. Mm -hmm. And the minute you change the frequency, things begin to shift. Now, very quick, of course, with the television in a human life, it takes a little longer. But that's... Right now, the results I have are an exact match to the frequency of my major dominant thinking pattern. And to change those results isn't about going out into the world of circumstances and moving them. You can do that. It just takes a ton of time to change something. That's why great business planners will give you a 10-year plan versus being able to condense that by a different means of how you partner with and align with the very power that's breathing each and every one of us that is unlimited. And in the book, you talk about um, a common thread of success or a way of thinking that uh, successful people um, often have. Could you could you talk a little bit about that? Well, one of the one of the ways is you you don't deny circumstances. I mean, you know, I have this much money. I have this much money in my account. There was a time in my evolution of this and working with my first mentor and how to think and live from a vision versus <laughs> letting circumstances completely dominate and control my outcomes. I, when I met him, 
I, I told him why I wasn't more successful in the world of teaching and transformation. I had built a little tiny work and it had gotten stuck after five years. Mm -hmm. I went looking for him. I thought he could just tell me in a sentence. He said, no, I can't tell you in a sentence, but I'll, I'll coach you. I'll mentor you. And I invested to work with him one year. He, that year he, he decided he wanted to work with three people who he believed had possibilities to really help lots of people. Um, I went to Detroit. I signed up for it. I went to Detroit and there were two men and myself that were going to be mentored. I was introduced to Wayne and Les and it turns out Les Brown, Wayne Dyer and Mary Morrissey. And he was our mentor. And we all signed up for one year when it was Les Brown was not who you know of or Wayne Dyer. We were beginning. And over time, we all kept signing up until five years later, he passed away. But my story to my mentor, Jack Boland, in the beginning was, well, I'm not more successful because I can only afford to rent this place on Sundays where we have lectures that um, it's an odd fellows hall. I clean it up in the morning from the gatherings they've had the night before. And it's got linoleum, old linoleum that's curling up on the edges and metal chairs that people have to sit in. And I don't have money for advertising. So notice Mary's thinking. It's all about conditions. I'm not having the success I want because, and <laughs> Jack Poland told me, I, I couldn't, I didn't have the awareness to really understand what he was saying. He said, it's not the linoleum, it's not the chairs, it's not the money for advertising that's stopping you. It's your thinking about those things that's stopping you. You put your power in those things. And once you decide I can't be successful because of that, you're, you get to be right. Let's change that. Let's change Mary. And those things won't even matter. It turned out he was absolutely right. Because within a year of his mentoring, for the first time after five years of being stuck on 50 people coming at the most, usually 40, I mean, we were at 120. Now, that, that was like more than a double shift. And there was still the linoleum and the chairs and the no money for advertising, but we were beginning to grow. <clears throat> and then over time, it grew and grew and grew until thousands of people were coming by the time he passed away. That was within five years. So the, per the, the source of the experience we're having isn't out there. It's in here. But it's a challenge to see it, you know, without some support. And that was my, my purpose in writing the book, Brave Thinking, is to give some very simple and highly effective ways of considering things and tools you can use uh, and test it out on your own life. You're going to have a life anyway. Why not have a life you absolutely love if you try out some things that could actually help you have that? Yeah. It seems to me, listening to you speak and, and reading your words, that there and I, I wonder, I often wonder about, you know, the idea of nature versus nurture environment that we grow up in, um, personality type. But it seems to me like you were someone who had a deep knowing, regardless of the circumstances life threw at you, and clarity around what you wanted at a young age. The only thing I knew for sure uh, was I wanted to be a teacher. That I knew from the time I was a little girl. I had a fifth grade, sixth grade teacher who I just admired her. And uh, and she was she loved teaching and she'd put fun lessons together. And I'd had a number of, you know, grade school teachers who were not that. And I just thought, oh, I, I and remember, I'm, I'm being raised in the 50s. I was born in 1949. So the model of what young women can choose as a profession was very different. Mostly it was nurses or teachers. Um, so my <laughs> framework was guided by the, the mindset that was in the culture. Uh, but, uh, you know, deep down, I believe over time, it became crystal clear that that was not just, um, what the fifties offered me. It was really was my soul's calling. And it, although, you know, I thought it was going to be classical classroom teaching. It wasn't long, uh, particularly because in undergrad work, I got so in, uh, interested in transformation and religions, uh, philosophies, science, all the different ways people produced transformation through the ages. Um, so I realized it wasn't classical content I wanted to teach even kids. I wanted to teach kids how to think and how to have a life they love because they could change their thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Oh, this story is so... So I guess what, where I was going with that comment is that 
it's not everyone that has that type of clarity. Even if your vision of what teaching is shifts as you grow up, I think there are many of us, and now I'm speaking for myself, that feel like you also speak to this in the book. There's so many interests that I have personally. There's so many things that I dabble in. Is it better to try all of these different things or get really clear on one thing that you get really good at? Um, I guess you could akin this to a 10,000 hours kind of a thing um, where I focus a skill and get really good at that one skill or explore because I'm not really sure what is my purpose? What is it that really calls to me if there's a lack of clarity in terms of, uh, let's say, what my vocation is or should be? Mm -hmm. I think a good question to ask ourselves is what brings you alive? What do you most feel alive doing? And over time, uh, it was clear to me that I came alive when I saw that light come on somebody or they came back and said, oh, I tried that and this is happening. And so life became more expansive for them. That that <laughs> I get up in the morning for that and all the different things I still do and in my 70s. Uh, so is what brings you alive. That's You'll begin to find your bliss in that. Um, the other is you're going to have, just keep breathing. And right now, all of us who are listening to this, you have results right now in four areas of life and keep breathing and you're going to have results in four areas of life. You can't not have health results. We all have health results. You can measure them how it, with all different means, weight, blood pressure, you know, all kinds of different ways. But then you have a, you have a health result. We also have relationship results how fulfilling our relationships are, how, how are we able to, to love and be loved fully in this lifetime? Um, there's a deep soul longing for, for each one of us. Some of us want lots of friends. Some of us want one or two that go deep in the journey. It's not about what you want, but it's about having a, a relationship quadrant. Maybe it's colleagues that um, you support, they support. I mean, but, but the idea of fulfillment is in our nature want fulfillment in the area of love and relationships. Vocation, whether you're an income doing it or not, your vocare is what you do with your time and talent that brings you alive, you, that you feel significant impact making, uh, difference making, you're growing, um, that that area of your life, and you might, you know, if you're 60 and you're picking up something new, you might be, an, you might become, find out that you're an artist. I mean, my grandma Moses didn't know she was 85 till she started painting. My mother didn't start painting until she was 85. Uh, and she wanted to paint on China. I mean, it was like, okay. Um, but that was only because my dad had died. And finally, the next year, she called me one day and she'd been around my work, but she'd never been in my work. And she called me one day and said, <laughs> it was so dear, she's gone now, but she said, okay, I guess if I'm still, if God is still breathing me, let me try that dream builder thing you do. <laughs> and that's how it started. She's 85. And my first question to her was this, is there anything you've ever, okay. I said, so here's a question to ponder. You don't have to answer it right now, but ponder this question. Is there anything you've ever thought about that came several times? Maybe you'd try that, but you didn't have time or didn't think you could, or it was an idea, but you shoved it down. Is there any of that? She knew immediately. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm certainly not an artist, but I always thought maybe I'd like to do some painting on China, like porcelain China. And uh, I said, so if you were going to take a step, what step would you take? And this is an important brave thinking tool is there's, I'm, I'm a firm believer uh, Tessa in baby steps you get a vision for something you'd love and then you go oh I can't do that it's too big it's too much it's too is what step can I take in the direction of that be willing to grow one step at a time but it's you have the vision the vibration and then you got to take an action on that even baby steps will take you all the way up Mount Everest but you got to keep taking them so what would you do mom what would you do if you you know thought you'd take a step in that direction Pause, and then she says, well, I guess I'll look and see if anybody's teaching classes around here. And one thing led to another that I will tell you, the next seven years of my mother's life were the most creative years of her entire life. She not only found out that she could, she found out she was good. 
And then her teachers kept advancing her and she's she's late eighties now. And she's now showing in galleries and all the families getting these gifts from her and she's prolific and she's alive. I mean, just this dynamic on on her 90th birthday, she wrote a book, started a nonprofit. um, And it was just an amazing thing to see that. Uh, So when she passed at 92, that seven year stretch had been uh, one of the most fruitful times of her life. Mm, I love that. So hopeful. I, I find this, all of this work so hopeful and Rosie and I both um, entering our fourth decade this year, thinking a lot about retrospectively, how are the, have the first 40 years been? What do I want my next 40 years to look like? I think there's a lot of, we can easily fall into the trap of it's too late for me. And I, I appreciate you speaking to this in terms of like, oh, it's too late for me to go back and get my MFA in creative writing. It's too late for me to become the next great American novelist. Um, yeah, when you have those thoughts, any of us, Memory. There's, um, so let me finish the fourth quadrant. It's health, relationship, vocation. And the last one is your freedom quadrant. Mm-hmm. Spirit is seeking freedom. I mean, it's, it's, think of life, call it life, call it whatever you want to call it, but it's pressing into and through all forms of itself, seeking to expand. We're in an, we're in an expanding universe. So that pull of becoming is everywhere present. So it's pulling a blade of grass today to be more of itself. That blade of grass will press through cement, seeking the light. That It's pressing through the edges of a tree to be more of itself today. The only difference between a grass or tree and you and me is in, in a grass, a blade of grass or a tree, there's no resistance to growth, to expansion. In the human we have the ability to resist the growth, to say it's not convenient, I don't have what it takes, and to thwart that pull of becoming, that life force seeking to express. When that occurs, life doesn't stop flowing through you. It just forms shapes of itself that are unlived life. We call those problems, difficulty, diseases, challenges where we didn't lean into the expanded growth. Life is more powerful than any one of us. So as you have an idea and like, okay, I'm 40. Oh, I should have gotten that before. And now I'm too late to start writing. You go, that's just a thought. It's not a truth. That, that is a common hour thought. What's the truth? When the truth is there's lots of people who have done amazing novel writing They didn't even start until their 60s or 70s. It's not a matter of age. It's a matter of what I believe about age that's going to dictate. That's why you want great thinking or whatever you call it. So you think beyond the circumstances, situations, and conditions. And you're asking a question again and again and again. Not what do I think I can have? What do you think I can have? What does the economy say I can have right now? Not what are conditions saying I can have? You ask this question. What would I love? And in this podcast, Radically Loved, it's based on the idea that there is a love. Now, many of us have grown up in religions where we make it a man in the sky. It's not. There is a love that governs and guides an intelligence in this universe. And you and I did not create each other. We did not create ourselves. We we find ourselves here. And we recognize that life Every day when we open up our eyes, uh, it's as if life is saying to you and me, behold, I am giving you my greatest gift this day. It's a gift of myself. No one gets to think your thoughts today, but you will make your choices. That's you. I've given you this gift of life. Do with it what you will. But then we inherit all this thinking that stuffs it down, is waiting and delaying. Meanwhile, life is moving on through. So why I believe this is such important um, work that you're doing with Radically Loved is to help us recognize this is very, very precious. And whether you live 100 years or not, uh, it comes and goes very quickly. And so this day has never happened before in eternity, and this day will never happen again. So it's what we do with it and what we think about that that's going to govern our results. I love that. I think um, so we we were touching on this subject before we started to record the podcast about that the idea that there is no 
I'm trying to remember exactly how you said it, Mary. There is no bad thing. It's it's our response to it. It's how we um, think about the situation. It's how we react to the situation. You started to say something about uh, creating the internal pause. Yeah, um, it's a, uh, I call it a brave thinking tool because it's, uh, you know, common hour thinking. Something happens that you've been programmed to think this is bad the first thought you have is, oh my God, this is bad. Um, so you got to do, if you if you, if you don't do something at, with the generativity of that thought, everything bad is going to show up for you because that's the frequency you're on. So let me, personal story. I mentioned that in October of 1971, a series of things occurred to help me recognize that I didn't, getting well was not an accident. It was, there was a, a physics, there was a science behind that. And there is a science behind how everything occurs. Nothing is random and nothing is accidental. Um, so one of those things that occurred was I was um, really encouraged to go to a lecture. Um, and I didn't really want to be there, but I went anyway. And I'm sitting several rows back. And the speaker said that day, um, you know, nothing is bad unless you think it's bad. And whether I cross my arms or energetically cross my arms, I'm going, that's not true. I mean, there's bad stuff in this world. Car wrecks are bad. Murder is bad. War is bad. Come on, there's bad stuff. And he says, I know what you're thinking, and I'll agree with you. Every one of us has things in this world we would love to change. But in the universe, there is the seed of good no matter what happens. And then he quoted Napoleon Hill, uh, quoting the world's most successful people. In every heartbreak, in every disappointment, there is a seed of an equal or greater benefit. But like any seed, it has to be found, planted, nurtured, grown, and then harvested. He said, so let me give you something you can try out. The next time something happens in your life that immediately you want to go, oh, my God, this is bad. Hit your internal pause button, wait three days. But during that three days, before you get upset, I mean, three days from now, you could still get all upset if you want to. But during that three days, don't, don't just sit by idly. During that three days, turn the volume up on your curiosity about what possible good there could be in it. And then start listing the possible goods and then go to work on those, bringing those out and see what happens. Okay, I heard the lecture, I went home. Two days later, I'm, I'm a mom of two young boys now. I'm in undergraduate school. My husband um, is, he's driving truck as a way to earn income so that I can get my education that I'll do, I'll earn it incomes for him to get his. So we've got a long-term plan here and he's working hard and he drives a long way to work and back. So I go to school in the morning, drop my boys off at, pre at preschool, bring them home, I'm making dinner. He walks in that night on Tuesday night this, the lecture was on Sunday. Um, he walks in two days later. He looks ashen. I said, what happened? And he says, there was a massive layoff at work today. A hundred of us got laid off. I, I don't have a job. And my first thought is, oh, my God, that's horrible. I'm in school. If you don't have a job, I'm not going to. And I'm at this point in my life, pretty self-focused. And it's all about Mary. You know, looking back years later, I should have gone over and hugged him. And said, I'm so sorry that happened. That must have been horrible. I didn't do that. It's all about Mary. So, oh, my God, I might have to quit school. And if you don't have a job and I'm all getting worked up about it. And then I went, wait, wait a minute. That guy Sunday said, Nothing is bad unless we think it's bad, but this seems so bad. What did he say to do? He said, wait three days. So it's five o'clock, it's Tuesday, five o'clock Friday. So wait three days before I panic. And what am I supposed to, oh, fine, hit my internal pause button. Where is that? How do I find it? And, and what do I do? Oh, turn the volume up on curiosity about what possible good, there's no good in this, this is horrible. And so we got the kids to bed and then he was better at it than I was. He said, well, I said, he got a piece of paper and he said, okay. And panic starts to rise up in me. And I'm, I'm practicing for the first time ever, my own ability to have a thought and say no to it. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll panic on Friday, Friday at five night. I'm pushing it away. What possible good could there be in this? And I said, I can't think of anything good. And he says, well, I tried 90 minutes to work and 90 minutes home. What if I found a job closer to home? 
And here's Mary at that point of awareness. And I'm saying, well, how are you going to do that? Is I don't know, but it could be good if I could have that. Well, I guess it could be good. What if I made more? How are you going to make more money? I mean, this, you're like at the top, you know, you're in a union. You're not, he's, I don't know, but what if I made more money? So he wrote closer to home, make more money. And he says, and what if I were working shorter hours? I said, you're, I think you're asking for too much. He says, well, I'm just saying what, what possible good there could be in this. And so we, he wrote down those things. We talked about it for a moment. I finished getting the kids to bed and went to sleep and went back to school the next day. Came home and he says, you know, I was thinking about places where might need drivers. And I went out today and, I, and they're closer to home and I filled out three applications. I said, are they hiring? And he says, well, they didn't say they were hiring, but I filled out the applications. He says, well, that's, if, if they're not hiring, you know, and I'm just so negative. <laughs> and and um, anyway, so the next day, uh, uh, before we went to bed that night, somebody called him and called him in for an interview the next day. And anyway, when I got home on day two of this three-day experiment, I walked in, he's just beaming. And I said, what happened? And he said, this company called. I went in for the interview. It's a route where I can, if I work uh, well and get, I can get done, I don't have to work specific hours. And it's closer to home, more money, shorter hours. He could ride his bike to work, which he loved doing. And it saved three hours of driving time almost every day. And I realized, Tessa, I realized that night I, for the first time in my life, I hadn't suffered in the same way, waiting for a circumstance to change before I could feel better. Every time that panic rose up, I would say no, Friday at five, I can still panic Friday at five. And it gave me a distance between circumstances and me. And that was the first doorway really for me, what the ancients called the witness self or the observer. That, I mean, right now you can, you can, I call it notice what you're noticing because every thought that we're thinking is either expansive and empowering or it's constrictive and disempowering. And you're going to fall on one side of that ledger with more thoughts being disempowering because conditions aren't, aren't supporting you having what you think you have to have to be able to have results. It's a shift in perspective so that we all have circumstances we want to change. But the most successful people aren't focused on the circumstances. They're focused on thinking and living from a vision, believing that things can work out that you as you get on the, the a match for what it is you would really love. Things are drawn to you. We all pretty much have been introduced to what's called the law of attraction. That is one of many invisible laws that govern the results we have. And frankly, it's a secondary law. The primary law is the law of vibration. Hmm. So as long as I'm wanting to get to my dream, I'm not a match for it. Henry David Thoreau says, I've learned this at least by my experiment. He did a two year, two month and two day experiment with what he called learning to suck the marrow out of aliveness. Hmm. Uh, and, and he wrote, he said, I didn't want when I came to die to find out I hadn't even really lived. And he did this experiment, wrote an essay on it. And there's a very famous quote in the conclusion, if one advances confidently in the direction of their dream. But it's not just a great quote, it's a code. If one, you don't have to advance, you can just stay stuck. You can believe your circumstances have control over you, you've got that right. Or if one advances in the direction of their dream, well, you can't advance in a direction you haven't dreamed up. No dream for your life can come true if you don't design it. No, your, your ultimate dream house can't get designed if you don't do a blueprint. So what would I love in these four areas? Not what do I think I can have, but what would I love? If one advances confidently in the direction of their dream, how do you be confident about something you've never had before? You're not confident in you. You're confident in these invisible laws. You got up this morning, put your feet on the ground. You weren't worried you were going to stick to the earth. You, you trust the invisible law called gravity. We trust all kinds of invisible laws. These invisible laws about how things occur are immutable. They work perfectly every time we work with them the way they work. If you advance confidently in the direction of your dream, even taking a baby step today, uh, endeavoring not to get to your dream, endeavoring to live the life you've imagined. So you might be in a little tiny place. You know, for me, when um, my husband Joe and I were dreaming up our first dream house, 
Um, the kitchen was very small and we did have a window over the sink, which I appreciated, but I wanted a kitchen island big enough for t- our, all our adult kids and grandkids to be around for 20 people to gather at holidays and birthdays. And I would be standing in that little kitchen sink looking out the window, but I'm imagining and feeling just like when I was imagining my little boy's hand uh, in high school and, and wedding. I'm imagining just standing there and the laughter and the fun, and I'm feeling that feeling. I'm endeavoring to live the life I've imagined from where I am with what I have as ideas and steps begin to occur to us. And he says, you'll meet with, you'll pass an invisible boundary, meet with a success unexpected in common hours, because the boundary, as much as I think it's money, time, education, it's not that. It's my thinking about that. So the boundary was never out there. It was always in me. And he says, you begin to live with a license of higher order of beings. And that's really the opportunity, and I believe the birthright of every single one of us to have and live a life you truly love living. I wonder if you speak to self-imposed limits, uh, self-worth as being something that is so, such a foundational concept, I guess, to embody, to intellectualize, to think about. I wonder if I could read a couple of sentences from this section um, and then hear you talk a little bit about it. Uh, This is from page 66, and I'm down at the last paragraph, and it says, many of us have been trained to believe we are unworthy. We may be operating from a paradigm that says something is fundamentally wrong with us, and so we do not deserve what we deeply desire. That belief is like a negative magnet pushing away any good we might attract. Um, And so, and then I'm going to skip down to the bottom. We become so careful, so fearful of mistakes that we remain on a short leash, never venturing into a realm wherein our greater life resides. This is a very draining, diminishing, and frightening version of life. I can't agree with you more. And I I also find myself in that limiting self-belief often stuck in that fear mindset as one of my major roadblocks to probably living the life I love. So I just... Um, love to hear you speak a little bit more about uh, self-worth as kind of a building block or an essential thing that we need to address. So, uh, so yeah, we, and it's good for us to challenge our basic beliefs. Like what does make a person worthy? What is that? I mean, it, well, it means I I do this and, it, and it, it's condition based. What makes every one of us worthy is something much more important. And that is that we're being breathed right now. If you've got breath, it didn't come from you. You can't earn it. It's given that you deserve to live a life that you choose. It can be a life of constriction, a life that you love. And you're given that authority over thinking. It gives you dominion over the results. So it's really a bit, uh, why I love this <laughs> radically loved is to it helps us recognize that it's in our hands to choose the thought that's empowering or the thoughts that's disempowering. So when that fear thought comes, go, oh, that's an old pattern. When that that feeling of self-loathing grows up, it's like, okay, that was then, this is now. And I actually train my clients in, in a move, a physical move. So this rises up, you take it. That energy, literally imagine you're just scooping it behind you and say, that was then. I used to believe that. I used to think that this is now. When you cut the energy, just like it's a command in the energetic field, what am I going to believe now that I choose to believe? I didn't breathe myself. I can't breathe myself. I didn't create myself. This is given to me. The only difference is, am I willing to lean into knowing, even though I don't feel it yet? I think people think that they have to feel the thought they're they're mm-hmm. thinking you don't you you feel what you feel now by repetition of thoughts that could completely be erroneous and not true and when you start to think a new pattern you don't feel it because feelings are secondary the thought is the vibration repeat it and your feelings are going to follow when you turn around and go well i haven't thought about not deserving something in quite a while and because you're unconsciously being very competent in noticing the thoughts that are contractive and replacing them with thoughts that are expansive. And you're going to find your whole life expanding. 
Mm, that's so helpful. And, and the thing about fear is the only time you're not feeling fear is when you're not growing. Mm. That means you're, I'm in my comfort zone. Mm. Oh yeah, I'm comfortable here. You're not growing. So the energy of making friends with that, this is, oh, good. I mean, maybe it doesn't feel good, but I am growing. You know, this is my opportunity. Mm, that's such a helpful reminder. I want to be mindful of your time. I want to know if there's anything that you wished I would have asked you uh, that we didn't get to touch on, or if there's a key takeaway, maybe from this conversation or from the book. Oh, I appreciate that, Tessa. I just want to say um, how, when the opportunity came for this podcast, how much I wanted to do it. I, I respect the work you guys are doing. Um, I know you got a meditation uh, training coming up and a retreat that's coming up in the fall. And I just encourage our listeners to look more deeply at Radically Loved and the opportunities here. In terms of uh, brave thinking, you don't get to not think. So since you're going to think anyway, is some discovery and how you move from being a person who asks circumstances, situations, and conditions. This is the definition of common hour thinking, looking to circumstances, situations, and conditions for permission as to who you can be, what you can do, and what you can have and give. As long as I'm thinking those ways, I will be governed by and constricted by the circumstances I'm in. Brave thinking. First of all, create a vision of what you would love regardless of your circumstances and then execute. And this book can help you. I know it can. And also if you go now and sign up for a book and bravethinkingbook.com, there's all kinds of bonuses that come your way as a gift. But just try it out. You're going to live anyway. Why not try it out and see if in fact you don't see your results expanding and growing because brave thinking is the courage to think and act from a vision regardless of the circumstance, situations, or conditions. I love that invitation. Mary, thank you so much for being here, for sharing your wisdom and your grace with us. We really appreciate the work you do. Really? Uh, yeah. Been- Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make sure all of these links get into the show notes so that people can find you easily and join you in your work. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast, and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.